Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 192 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at ZapMap and what they got hidden underneath the covers data-wise. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to thank everyone who retweets, links, and helps promote this podcast across the socials. It helps me greatly uh, whenever anybody retweets or reposts or retweets or whatever action your social media app of choice requires you to do this episode across the internet. I'm always happy to see the word spread about the podcast. Thank you very much. Our main topic of discussion today is data, and more specifically, charger and charging data. Now, as you know, this podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, and the vast majority of people who use ZapMap know it for one or more of the three key things that it does. Locates chargers, navigates to chargers, pays for charging. So those are the three key features. But what a lot of people don't know, or know but don't realize the extent of, is that ZapMap gather a huge amount of data related to each charger and its usage. Some of this data is provided on a summarized monthly basis to indicate the number of new chargers installed on a given month. Some of it's used to determine the average cost of charging at various types of chargers. But there's a huge amount of additional data that we as end users don't generally get to see, use, or understand. Now, ZapMap has a whole unit called the Insights Unit that n- investigate this data. And I'm delighted to welcome Jade Edwards, the head of Insights at ZapMap, to the show. Hi, Gary. Nice to be here. Can you start by giving me your EV journey? How did you come to the EV space? Yeah, so I work for about 12 years in a data and insights consultancy um, in financial services, um, not in the EV space, dealing mainly with insurance and, and general insurance at that. So car insurance was probably the closest link. What I was looking for when I was moving on for that role was I didn't know whether to go in something that was kind of non-profit or something in the charity sector, but I just knew I wanted to do something where I felt I was really having more of an impact, something that I could be really, really passionate about the the, the whole industry, not just my particular role within it. And when the role came up at ZapMap, I was really excited and um, was really, really keen to try and make that happen and successful so I was really thrilled to join the team and get into the EV charging world. Let's let's talk ZapMap itself. Now many people think that um, it just produces that fantastic app that finds charges but there's way more to it than that. So talk to me a little bit about the Insights department itself and why it was set up and what it does. Yeah so the the role of Insights within ZapMap really is to take the data that sits behind the app, refine it, package it, analyze it, and then share it with our many stakeholders. Um, so from EV drivers and the industry sort of publicly, so via our stats pages in the reports we put out, news items and stories, as well as then commercially to our clients and partners who could be charge point operators, utilities companies, consultancies, government bodies, local authorities, things like that. Wow. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's, let's break that down a little bit. Now you talked about the data that's gathered by the app. And obviously, as a ZapMap user, I know that you've got locations of charges, you've got some of the chat that um, that is added by users, check-ins and that sort of stuff. Uh, and you've also got the data for a number of the CPOs where you ping to to check that it's still up, uh, that the, the charge is actually still available, etc. Now, is that the data we're talking about? Or is there other stuff behind that that we may, as an I as an end user may not necessarily see, but which you as ZapMap have access to? Yeah, that's the majority of what we work with on a on a daily basis at the moment. Um, so certainly the locations of all the charge points, as you've said, um, we've got we estimate over 95% of all the UK's public charge points on the app. Then the availability of them, and that's for over 70%. 
showing where we've got that availability so we can utilize that data as well. Um, another key aspect is um, our, our ZapMap users. So we have asked people when they register whether they'd like to be on our survey panel. Um, and one of the things we do is on an annual basis, we do, we believe it's the UK's largest EV driver survey. And we actually go out to the, to the panel of EV drivers and ask them what they think about the public charging network, about the um, experience that they've been having. Now, we take me through the, the technical aspect of this. Is the data that you get, is it analysed from the underlying database record by record, charger by charger, comment by comment, or does it have to go through some sort of an aggr uh, aggregation process which summarises that data that, that the Insights team look at? Is there, you know, how, how does that work? Yeah, it's a bit of a mix, really. We obviously review all the data that we've got before we then look at passing that out in any form, whether that's on the map directly to EV drivers or whether it's something that we've done with it and, and how we share it through the insights team. We can provide some of that data at really quite a granular level, so down to the specific details of a specific charger. Um, other areas we look at more aggregated, so when we're trying to understand the um, usage of the public charging network, then that we look at it in a more aggregated way to understand what's the average number of sessions that might be happening per day in a particular region of the UK, for example. And ditto with the information we'd get from our ZapMap users, that would be looked at in a more aggregated way to understand patterns of how different groups of users might be experiencing the public charging network. From a usage point of view, you've obviously got this data and you've talked there about how some of it's aggregated and some of it's down at, at the detail level. Do you have internal customers within ZapMap who are saying, I need this, I need that, I need this at this level? Or are you providing that all that data out at various levels of abstraction and the other parts of ZapMap are actually using it for whatever they want? Is it a push or a pull type of uh, situation? We provide information and insight across the business. Um, so some of it is on request from areas if they're looking at perhaps the subscriptions that we've got and trying to understand what's happening there. What what can we offer um, to our EV drivers that would um, really add value so we can help and support in those kinds of areas. We also provide lots of um, kind of MI for the business as well so that we can track the growth of the users on the app, for example and understand how the business is growing in different ways. But the main thing that we do um, is that push of information out outside of ZapMap and out into the market or to the public. So we have the stats pages where we look at the number of charging points and the growth over time. We have the price index where we've been reviewing the number of sessions that happen across the different um, networks and the price points of those. So then we can see actually what's the average price that drivers are paying for their public charging. And then we're also pushing information out through partners um, like the Department for Transport, for example. So their fantastic reporting that they do, looking down to a local authority level on the numbers of charge points across the UK, that's information that we provide to them. And then they do further analysis and, and get those reports out on a monthly and a quarterly basis too. Interesting. Now, Obviously, with a name like Insights, there's an expectation that somehow your department will turn up one day and say something like, you know, we've been looking at the data and it seems that on a Tuesday after a bank holiday, more people charge using 50 kilowatt chargers than any other day of the year. Now, obviously, that's a, a bit of an extreme example, but is it like that or are you just looking at specific things that people have requested? Is there an element of, let's see what's hidden in the data that we might not see at the moment? Oh yeah, there's definitely an element of that. The team are really passionate about what they do and about trying to get the best out of the information that we've got at hand. So we're always looking at the data in new and interesting ways to try and drive more value out of it. Um, because there is, you know, we have got this wealth of information and we need to make sure that we're using that to its best advantage and, and help that to create kind of real impact um, out in the market and help drive the transition overall. So it is, you know, a bit of questions being asked in, but also us looking at things and, and trying to pick out actually what's going on and what, what's really interesting here. So let me put my job interview question on and give me an example of something where you've 
where you've done that, you've looked at the data and you've found something specifically that you weren't looking at, but, but which turned out to be ultimately very interesting? Well, one thing that we've done recently that we actually did with CISTRA and the Committee for Climate Change on the report they've been working on was looking at the number of charging sessions across the strategic road network and trying to understand where do the peaks uh, happen in those charging sessions. And something that we saw within that was that when you broke the strategic road network down into very different um, routes across the UK, you could see some really, really big differences at the peak time of travel. So, for example, we looked at um, a route that was from Cambridge uh, down to Brighton. And for that route, route along the strategic road network at peak times, then the average number of sessions per device per day was up at around 10 sessions. Whereas we also looked at a route that went from Peterborough to Great Yarmouth. Along that route, it was the peak was down as, as low as four sessions per device per day. So that you really see that kind of variation around um, where you might expect that actually the peak would possibly be similar um, across different kind of routes when you're, you're purely looking at a number of sessions per day. But even at that level, you can see some real differences. Ah, that's interesting. Now, obviously, you've, you've got a lot of data here, some of which is CPO specific and some of which is general. Do you get requests in from specific CPOs for additional data that you may be able to provide that will help them augment the data that they're already getting from charging sessions uh, on their networks? Yes. Yeah, we have really good relationships um, with lots and lots of the CPOs across the UK and we work really closely with them. So they will come to us and we'll, we'll provide additional information so that they can see how, how are they positioned within the market, understand, you know, they can see obviously their own performance really, really well, but trying to understand actually what does that look like more competitively um, and how can they think about um, where they're positioned within the market and where they want to be. So yeah, we work really closely with them on those, those kind of fronts. And where is that dividing line? Because I know if I was CPO A and I had all my own data in-house, and I know that you as ZapMap have a lot of data relating to our competitor CPO B, who may be running along the same routes, the specific routes that you were talking about there. At what point do you say, well, no, actually, I can't give you that data for CPO B because it's nothing to do with you. And at what point do you say, well, actually, yes, some of that is available for sale. Is there a demarcation line there? Yeah, there definitely is. Um, we've worked with the CPOs over the years to build those positions so that it's actually really clearly understood between different CPOs, what we can share, what we can't, and we don't cross any of those lines because it's really important for us to be trusted within the industry and to be impartial with our role as ZapMap, whether it's ZapMap Insights or ZapMap as, as a whole, is we want to help the EV drivers better navigate the public charging network and we want to support the CPOs to do the very best job that they can do. So we want them all to be successful. We want that fantastic um, network out there for EV drivers to use. So it's really important to us that we partner with them and we support them and we um, drive things forward positively. Um, and it's a really collaborative industry. So although individual CPOs obviously are competing, you'll see them together on panels and in conferences in so many ways, collaborating, supporting each other and helping to drive things forwards because everybody wants the same outcome at the end of the day. I did an episode last season on uh, hubs and I spoke to Melanie and she spoke to Paul and who presumably spoke to you and you provided me with a nice chunk of data on uh, all the hubs around the country with four or more DC chargers split by charge point operator. How easy is it to go into the system and provide that information? Is that a chunk of work or is that like a, I'll, I'll show you how old I am now, is that a C, an SQL statement that will do that or what? What's, what's the, me the mechanism behind that? 
yeah, all those kind of requests, it, it, it's varying amounts of work to get that data, but all the data we have is it's brought into ZapMap from all the individual CPOs. We cleanse all that data. We onboard it. We store it. We refine all that data. So a lot of that work has already been done by the, the data team within ZapMap to make sure that then that data can be pushed out to the app. So we already have it in a really accessible format. And then the insights team are then querying that. So yeah, like you would say with with SQL queries and things like that, we're we're querying that data and looking at it in different ways. And actually one of the questions you asked earlier where you asked about where we found insights that we weren't expecting, one of those was actually with regards to the hooks. Because when we had a look at that data, we were expecting, we looked at it across all different regional areas of the UK, And we thought, we're probably going to see that it's a very big concentration in London in the Southeast. And that's what people would expect. But what does it actually look like? And when we pulled that data out, that's when we discovered that actually for every geographical area around the UK, excluding unfortunately Northern Ireland, they had at least 10 hubs and there was huge growth across all those areas. So that was something that then, you know, kind of surprised us and we wanted to put out there in the market and and get out there in the media as well. That's another thing that we try and and do is get supporting information out to the media. And that was a great story that shows actually there's there's a lot of investment going in across all the different regions of the UK. It's not just a London, Southeast centric situation. So that was another piece that that's come out recently where we've been able to put out some really positive information out, not only to the market, but also that's got picked up in the mainstream media as well. And I know one of the things that surprised me about that data when it arrived, obviously I look at the figure at the bottom, how many hubs have we got? And in my, in my mind, we had, you know, 60, 70, 80 hubs across the whole of the country. And then I look and I forget what the exact figure was, but I think it was somewhere up around 300 separate hubs across the UK at the moment, which was just mind blowing. And then of course, you've just re- recently released data that indicate that that has increased by, is it 50% in the last 12 months? Yeah. So it depends again, typical insights and data side things. It depends how you cut the data, but the way we looked at it uh, for our purposes this time was we looked at hubs and define them as where there are at least six rapid or ultra rapid devices. So for them, we've got 196 at the moment around the UK, and that's more than double the number that were in place a year ago. Right. So I I went for four or more, you went for six or more. Fair enough. Uh, Now, we've talked a little bit, we've talked quite a lot about the kind of data you've got. We've talked about the customers that, that you have, both internal and external. Is the Insights Department a profit center, a cost center? Do you sell the data externally or do you give it away? We do both. So we give a lot of data away and then we also sell it. So yeah, we've got commercial partnerships as well as partnerships where we're providing information out for supporting reports and and papers and things like that too. And what's the demarcation line on that? Because at some point you're going to have to say, well, this data is free, this data is free, this data you're going to have to pay for. Is that a a level of aggregation or or is it just the... The, the, quad, the type of data that you're providing yourself, which determines whether it becomes something that you sell or something that you provide free of charge? Um, it can be uh, to do with either the type of the data or the usage of the data, whether it's something that we feel is really important that supports the wider industry and helps that transition to zero emission vehicles, then we'll provide more data on that for free. And things that help EV drivers understand what's happening um, at a level that's relevant to them, then we'll make sure we're providing that information. And then when it gets more detailed or it's for very specific parties, then that's where it will become commercial. Now, talk to me a little bit about the data that you provided for EVA England recently. They produced a, I think they called it a constituency map, which broke down the country into specific constituencies and there was a lot of underlying data there from numerous sources, one of which I believe was uh, ZapMap. Is that correct? Yes, it's absolutely correct. It's a 
partnership that we've been working on for a while and we're really excited to see that map finally go live. You know, it's taken a, a lot to get to this point. The EVA team have been working tirelessly on that one. So yeah, really exciting to see that out. We've provided a summary of all the public charge points in the UK and split them down by whether they were rapids and ultra rapids or whether they were on streets. And we kind of took the Teslas separately as well so that they could produce this map, which you could look at constituency by constituency and see actually what are the the types of charges that are going, that are in that constituency. Look at that by the number of BEVs that are in constituency. Um, and then I think they've also pulled in loads of really informa- in, interesting information on air quality as well. But yeah, that's a really great tool. And yeah, really pleased to see that go live. I want to sort of drop down and become a little bit geeky on this. Because if I'm looking at this from a data point of view, the the way that that data is actually classified, because you've said yourself, there's constituents, it's broken down by constituency. Now, I, I don't believe for one second that when somebody sets that map up, they said, we're going to have a data field that talks about constituency and we're going to be able to, to track stuff by constituency. So at some point, either that data has then been entered retrospectively or that data field has been entered retrospectively or somebody has taken the data out and manipulated it externally to map postcodes to constituencies. What was that process uh, like? Oh, you are getting into the detail now, Gary. <laughs> this is where Tim, one of our analysts, will be listening to this podcast and going, Jade, better get this right. Um, so, yeah, what we did on that um, was we pulled the data out at postcode level and then we got postcode mappings basically for all the constituencies in the UK and match that together. So the corollary question that goes with that is, is there a certain process that you have where you look through and you go, right, we've got X number of data tables with X number of fields in there, which will give us the ability to slice and dice data a certain number of ways. But wouldn't it be good if we had an additional data field that did this, and then you extend the, the data tables to capture that data? Or... Are you always working, I would say always, are you working retroactively to say, oh, right, now we've got, for example, constituency data, so we can put that into the, the database. Is it, are you working proactively or, or retroactively to extend the data, the fields that are in the database? It's a bit of a mix of both, really. Yeah, there's certain areas where we're saying, oh, this would now be really interesting to look at. So one of the things recently that one of the analysts and wanted to look at was by classifying the session data that we get in by days of the week and also whether is it a bank holiday, is that a weekend day, is it a weekday and what, you know, was it Christmas day, all that kind of thing. So actually building in tables like that, that then we can match that data to so you can see patterns uh, that, that jump out from looking at it that way. So that's one where it's just been, oh, let's have a look at that and let's build that in as well. And then other ones will come like this constituency one where it's a specific project where we want to look at it in a certain way. So yeah, it's a bit of both that some of them will be things that we want to collect additionally in the data and others will be that we can add that information afterwards when we're doing analysis. So yeah, a bit of a mix of both really. Because the other aspect to that is it's okay having a whole load of, a whole database full of data uh, and being able to extract that. But at some point, you've got to be able to visualize that in a way that makes sense. So what sort of tools do you have that allow you to take some of that data and look at it in a way where the insights will pop out a lot easier than they would if you're having to pour through sheet after sheet after sheet of spreadsheet data, for example? Yeah, we can we can look at the data either through dashboards and look at it that way. We can look at it, we're doing more looking at it spatially. So looking at heat maps and things like that with, with the spatial data. So yeah, there's lots of different ways that, that we work with that data within the business and different ways we'll be starting to share that as well on the website, for example. So we start to share more in infographics and things like that as well to try and get the messages out and get them across in a simpler way because it is just you know lots and lots of numbers 
So trying to find different ways to visualize that and, and simplify the message is really important. And I think that's something I've definitely noticed on the, uh, on the stats page on, uh, on the website. There's definitely more improved visualizations of a lot of the data. And in fact, as I say, the, the thing that you sent out this morning showing the, the way the number of charges has increased over the last year, the number of, and then splitting that by types of charger and splitted it by hubs and things like that. I think it's, uh, you know, it's good that that's the way that, uh, that that's actually happening. So well done for that. Now, what was the question I was going to ask there? And that is, tell me something that an outsider wouldn't necessarily know about ZapMap and the Insights team that would make them go, oh, I never do that. I think one of the things that would surprise people is probably about ZapMap as a whole, not just about the Insights team is, and it's certainly something that surprises people when I talk to EV drivers that know of ZapMap and then I tell them I work for ZapMap and they, they go, oh my God, wow, you work for ZapMap, that's amazing. They don't realise quite how um, the size of the company that we are. So we're generally assumed to be a much, much bigger company than a local Bristol founded business. And that I think really does surprise people because of the, the kind of punch that ZapMap packs with its app and with all its accompanying services. We are actually quite a small team. I think you definitely, what's the phrase, punch it above your weight? Yeah. You know, ZapMap is one of the acknowledged leaders in the, the app space for electric vehicles. And I think people, they think of an app and they think, well, you know, there's this huge, business, huge tech company behind it. And like you say, you're, you're a relatively small company in, in Bristol. And then, as you say, if you then start to add a lot of the extra things that we talked about today, a lot of the, the data analysis and the, the reporting and the statistics and things like that, you're getting a lot out of what is essentially not a particularly big team. So uh, well done to you all for that. Oh, we enjoy it. We definitely got a very, it might be a small team, but we're a very, very passionate team of people, that's for sure. And it's amazing how far passion goes in a business like this, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. You're in a specific situation now with, with the insights data. You've got a lot of uh, charges out there. You've got a lot of data that you're capturing out there. You have a number of customers, uh, both internal and external, who are making use of the data. Where are you going from here? What's, what's the next step for the insights department at SatMap? Yeah, so there's, there's quite a few things that we're working on at the moment. So new things coming up. We've got our latest survey is going to come out um, in the next few weeks. So that will be going to the EV drivers and getting the most up-to-date opinion on the public charging network. So we're really looking forward to getting that out into the field. And we're going to really look at that into the sort of the habits of those with on-street parking versus those without on-street parking so that we can really understand what that's like at the moment and obviously as we start to see more ev drivers without off street parking we want to be help making sure we're helping and putting out information that supports them so that's going to be an interesting one the other thing we've been working on with a uh, sort of across industry is that there will be introducing new power rating bandings so that's going to reflect the new um, public charge point regulations and the industry, the levels that were within there. They've kind of been set out, but what industry's trying to come together around some new terminology for those power rating bandings because we want to try and move it away from kind of any confusing language for new, new EV drivers coming into the space. So that's a, a big piece that's been going on for a while and... We're yeah, working across industry to try and move that forwards. So the reporting we do on the stats page, we've just put in a new graph and just snuck it in down the bottom at the moment just to show what the, the numbers look like for those bandings. And then we'll be starting to transition to those. And that means we'll be able to start to transition as well to some new graphs and charts on the stats pages. So keep an eye out for that. The other work we'll be doing is we'll be doing other kind of partner partnerships to try and combine our data set with other people's data as well. So the EVA England one was a good example, trying to combine our data with Bev's data, with the equal data. We like people to combine those sets of information. 
So that's something we'll be doing more of. And then we'll be planning new products as we get more data through, as the market develops and trying to simplify the uh, delivery of what we have to clients as well. So, you know, we're, we're looking, particularly we look at the locations, the utilization of, of um, charge points and the pricing. So we'll be looking at what else we can do in those areas as well. Um, and then the other thing, which is a little bit that map thing, which is imminent, you will get the, um, the heads up on this, Gary, is that as you saw from the end of September figures, we were not quite at 50,000 devices, but we are now at 50,000 devices. And so we'll be putting out a bit of a splash on that in the coming days. So obviously when this comes out, it will, we will have done that piece, but you get to hear about it um, just before um, we get that out there in the market. Yeah, I was disappointed when it was only... 49,000, whatever, 800 or whatever. It's so close, but I'm really glad that it's, um, it's gone up over that figure now. Yeah. Is there a question you were expecting me to ask you that I didn't ask you? I thought you'd probably ask us why, why people came to ZapMap for data and insights, why people didn't just see it as it's an app for consumers. Um, yeah. So I thought you might ask me that question. Well, in that case. Tell me why people actually initially came to ZapMap for data rather than looking at it and saying, oh, well, it's just an app to, I like to, to identify and locate charges. What made them think there was all this data under there that you would be willing to provide? So I think there's probably three reasons for that. I think one of them is the heritage that ZapMap's got. So Mel and Ben, especially as the co-founders of the business, they've been in the industry from the outset. So I think they saw that need that it wasn't there wasn't just a need for mapping for EV drivers and switching people to move to EV, but there was also a need to help support the wider industry. So they've been out there this whole time talking about the data that, that what sits behind the app and making sure that they, those insights were surfaced for the industry. So I think because they've been doing that, that heritage has kind of meant that people then see ZapMap as a thought leader in the space and know that we will be putting information out there that they can use and, and rely on. Second area is probably the, just the basic coverage that we've got. People realised if they were going to ask, if they wanted to know about charge point numbers, if they came to us, they'd get the most complete picture of the charging landscape at any point in time. So I think that was driving people to come and, and ask that map proactively. Can you share some more of your data with us? And then the third area, I think, is, is the overall kind of engagement. And it's kind of what I, I spoke about before, that we're really passionate as a team. We always want to do more. We want to look at the data in new and interesting ways and drive more value from it so that we can create that impact and, and help drive that transition to sustainable transport and zero emission vehicles overall. And if... People, and when I say people, I'm primarily meaning third party sort of business to business, but it could be, you know, people like myself who are just interested. If people want to get specific data from you, how do they do that? What's, what's the process? Is this something that anybody can sort of talk to you and, and, and ask a question or, or what? Yeah, it certainly is. Um, you can go on the website. You can see contact us details from looking at the stats pages or the price index there's more information you want to know that's not on the website, then send us an inquiry through there, or they can simply email insights at zap-map.com. And we will put that in the, uh, in the show notes. At what point if someone comes in and says, right, I need all this data and I want it broken down in 25 different dimensions and da, 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 da. At what point do you then look at that and go, right, that's something we can do, but this is how much it's going to cost you versus... Yeah, okay, that's something that we already have and you can have that for free. Is there a, who, who makes that decision? What's the rationale behind that? Yeah, that's just within the team, really. So we'll have, have conversations with people that are sent in inquiries and then we'll work out where that line sits on any particular inquiry. So yeah, there's lots and lots that we provide out for free and we will continue doing so. That's a really important part of our role. And then there are other areas where, yet yeah, we do have to charge for that. And so we'll then put a package together, but it's making sure that it really offers value to whoever's looking, looking for that data or that insight 
and making sure, you know, from our perspective, we want to be providing something that's helping them drive change and move things forwards. So if we don't think we can help, we can support that, then we'll be honest about that and say that's not something that we're able to do at the moment. Or actually, we think this information would really help you and we'll point them to wherever that information is. So whether that's through the Department for Transport and the information that's already out there or through other partnerships we've done, we've did a partnership with Field Dynamics, for example, and they have a fantastic interactive map on their website, which lets you see for different areas around the UK, the um, estimated kind of coverage as charges for those who don't have off-street parking. So trying to understand actually what's within a five-minute kind of walk of people's homes. So yeah, we've got loads of information out there as well. So there's lots and lots of things we can point people to and say, actually, yeah, there's already a lot of information out there that you might not realise is out there. Yeah, actually, I was chatting with someone from Field Dynamics exactly about that last week. Uh, it's an interesting little concept, that. But he does bring up the, the next question, which is, has anybody actually asked you for anything? And you said, no, we don't actually have that or we can't actually supply that. But that's actually a very, very good idea and we should start gathering that data. We wouldn't be an insights team if we weren't like, Oh, that's a good idea. That's interesting. We'd love to look at that data or we'd love to do something with that. Yeah. Uh, the difficulty is not in the what data is is there and what could possibly be done with it. The difficulty is just in the prioritizing. What do you look at? What is going to add the most value to the industry overall? And generally the way we look at that is try and think what matters most to EV drivers. And what matters most to them is then likely to be what is most important to all the businesses within that industry because they're all trying to cater to that need. So we just constantly have to try and take it back to that. But yeah, there's, there's just so much. There's so much opportunity um, within this whole industry. It's a really exciting place to be. And yeah, we're definitely not short of, of ideas from the, from the many, many partners that we work with, clients and and um, people who are interested in the data and just interested in the sector overall. Jade Edwards, thanks for your time. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Gary. So a couple of quick takeaways from that discussion. The Insights team is a crucial piece of the bigger Zap map picture. They've got access to a large amount of data coming from their app. This includes charger-specific data, location-specific data, pricing data, usability data, and it can be packaged up in whenever, whichever way they want. And the whole area of data presentation is key. Listing pages and pages of spreadsheet data is something that's good for, you know, data geeks like me. But to really find the insights into it, the data has to be formatted and displayed in a way that allows the insights to appear natural. And that's why ZapMap are looking at different ways to get this data out to people. One example was the recent post they produced graphing the current growth and projected growth of public charges in the UK. It showed the public charges were set to double in the next 20 months or so. Jade also mentioned the EVA England constituency map, which is a really cool visualization tool for seeing how many charges are in your specific area and how this number is changing over time. There's a link in the show notes for that. Many thanks to Jade for coming on and chatting with me. it's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. To the naked eye, the third T20 between England and New Zealand at Edgbaston this summer was just another afternoon of cricket, beer, sixes, and the occasional chance from the famed holly stand. But for Edgbaston, this was a step into what they see as cricket's future. Edgbaston has decided to go green. They made sure that the 5,000-seater stadium was run entirely off wind, hydro, and solar power. The four and six cards that were waved in the crowd at cricket matches for two decades or more are now being produced with seed paper, which, when planted at home, will grow wildflowers. Lawn mowers and the roller used to prepare the plane surface were switched to electric alternatives, while red meat was banned from the hospitality menus. You see, climate change is one of cricket's uncomfortable truth. Uh, reports into its impact on sport have said that cricket will be the hardest hit of all those that use a pitch or field. Around 40% of the cricket grounds in England and Wales, thousands in the recreational game, are at the risk of the impacts of a changing climate, whether through drought 
or flooding. And edge baston is one of several grounds that are making sustainability moves, and that's something that we all like to see, right? The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got electric. It's available on Amazon worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've got renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you got to this part by tweeting me amusing CV with the words, what an insight. Hashtag, if you know, you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder, Simon. You know, he's kicking out lots of unicycle content on his YouTube channel nowadays, but he's always complaining that he'd like to send out more. As most of his videos require him to actually get out, do a trip and record it, the critical thing is finding some time in his busy schedule to actually do the rides. I asked him if he had his own way, how long he'd like to spend out riding and recording videos. He told me, all the time. Thanks for listening. Bye.